This episode of Scarber Supremacy was brought to you by DeathRayDesigns.com. It is an affordable, high-quality form of MDF terrain and gaming supplements in order to bring your games to the next level. You can check out their website at DeathRayDesigns.com. I am a personal fan of this stuff, and I'm a good friend with the owner of the company, Austin Thompson. And I can tell you right now that if you buy his stuff and you invest in his new Kickstarter coming out, you will not be disappointed. That is DeathRayDesigns.com. Here's the episode. Welcome to episode one of Skirmish Supremacy. This is a podcast that's going to be dealing with smaller war games, uh, anything in the skirmish realm, a lot of unknown games, unknown companies that we want you to know more about. We will also be covering a lot of stuff from board games to card games to RPGs and anything else that we decide to put on our fucking channel. With me today is my co-host, Nick Bogart. How you doing, Nick? I'm doing pretty good. Awesome. Excited to be here. Well, you sound that way. How about you pep up a little bit, damn it? <laughs> <laughs> I am your host, Tim Korkleski. Uh I will be the one that's uh, kind of running this show, making sure everything's uh, moving smoothly and hopefully keeping all of you people entertained out there. So th- being first episode, we figured we would introduce ourselves a little bit, uh, talk to you guys a little bit about ourselves on a personal level, because I feel that's one thing a lot of podcasts are missing these days, and uh, kind of give you a chance to know a little bit more about us. Past that, we're going to go into some of the games that we're excited to cover, certain things that we're going to be uh, doing in the future. And we're going to roll it out from there. So, Nick, I'm going to go ahead and ask you real quick. So what is it that you do for a living? Uh, for a living, I am a malware analyst. Awesome. So I... oh. you basically are the one that's out there uh, debugging stuff. <laughs> right. Um, so I work for I work for an agency, and when we, uh, whenever anything bad happens, uh, we get funny emails or someone downloads something that they shouldn't have, I get to look at it, take it apart, figure out if it was something bad or, you know, not. As my kid says, it sounds pretty boring. (laughs) As my coworkers say, I'm bored until they're freaking out, so. Well, that's a good problem to have. I guess that means you spend most of the day listening to podcasts and YouTube. (laughs) <laughs> yes yes <laughs> plenty of the time listening to podcasts on youtube nice nice so i uh myself on a career level i actually work for a company called publisher services inc so yes i am actually in the board gaming industry uh publisher services inc for those of you out there that are not aware we actually help cater and are a consignment warehouse for a lot of the game companies out there like uh catalyst cryptozoic and a lot of games of that nature i won't go into too much detail because obviously there's a lot i can't talk about but just uh we handle lots and lots of stuff so fortunately for me it makes it easy to get guests so nick (laughs) tell tell me a little bit about uh, what's going on your side of things we know about what you do for work but uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself uh myself uh married i've got two kids actually right now it uh it works out that my uh my actual gaming time isn't a whole lot because my wife, uh, we just recently moved to the area here in, uh, in Georgia, and my wife is, is still in Florida. She comes up like every other weekend to, to visit, and um, so I've got, I've got my 10-year-old and my uh, 4-year-old, or almost 4-year-old. <clears throat> so, you know, that's... That, that's my situation right now. I'm I'm in the process of setting up my game room and and getting everything rolling here, and looking for a babysitter so that I, you know once or twice a week I might be able to go out and do a little bit of gaming. Well, hey, I mean, you got to try to fit it in where you can. So, uh, your wife is located down in Florida at the moment. What what is it that she does that's kind of keeping you guys apart? Um, so she, she's an analyst. She works for the government down there. And, um, and so she's just trying to transfer her job up here, but right now she can't. 
Gotcha. So your wife is a spy. <laughs> no. <laughs> they they you know, it might be one of those on on that little like, little funny meme chart, you know, what what people think I do, what I think I do thing, but no. Yeah, nothing of that nature, huh? Well, we could always pretend. So as far as our listeners are concerned, your wife is a spy. We're going to leave it at that. So <laughs> just to tell you guys a little bit more, more about myself, uh, I actually am married. Uh, my beautiful wife, Dana, is in the other room and thinks that most of the stuff that I do when it comes time to the wargaming hobby is complete nerd shit. So as far as that goes, um, you know, she definitely supports me in everything I do. We are really close, and I try to bring her into it as much as possible. I'm hoping at some point in the future I can drag her onto the podcast and ask her some embarrassing questions and see if she'll answer them. So, uh, that's, uh, trying to think what else is there to talk about. I mean, past that, I've done some kickboxing. I've done mixed martial arts. Uh, I'm still pretty heavily involved in that. It's probably my primary sport. Football to me is no fun to watch at all. So that's really all I got on that. Boo. Yeah. Well, well, you know. <laughs> What do you want me to say? I enjoy kicking people in the face, but, uh, <laughs> all right, well, I'll, I'll stop making fun of you. <laughs> so Nick, I take it. You're kind of a football fan. Uh, I, I like it. I'm not, I'm not a huge fan, uh, go giants, but you know, I, I do like to watch it occasionally, you know, the Super Bowl is a, you know, semi big event. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also works out that it falls, you know, pretty much right around my birthday. So, even as an adult, I can, you know, throw a birthday party and call it a Super Bowl party. Well, hey, you can't go wrong with that. Mine, uh, unfortunately, is during the cold months of November, so usually any time I try to plan anything for my birthday, it's like, let's make it indoors. <laughs> <sighs> Refreshing. So, we talked a little bit about ourselves. Nick, what are some of the things that you are excited to cover on this channel? What games are you playing right now? What games are you excited about? Obviously, you and I have talked a lot off uh, off of the podcast about some of the games you're excited about. Why don't you fill us in on some of those? All right, so games I'm excited about. Right now, one of the big ones is Ninja Turtles. It's coming out. It's on Kickstarter right now, and the game just looks awesome. For one, it's Ninja Turtles. Uh, that that just alone is is awesome. But um, just watching uh, it, it's only been up a few days. It's already met its goal, and it's on like its tenth or twelfth stretch goal. Oh really? Um, oh yeah. So so at first they had little tokens for some of the bad guys. Like you only had a few bad guys. Now all of them are actual miniatures. They've made some of them bigger. They've brought in new villains. They've they've already done a whole lot of expansion, and it's got some of the original writers, um, the the current comic book series people are involved with it. I mean, you know, it's just got a whole lot of people involved that are just making it awesome. You know, each each character is unique. Um, you've got Casey Jones, you've got April O'Neil, you got all the turtles, Splinter, um, you got Shredder. All of them are coming in, so I'm I'm really excited about that one. That's coming out. I, I get like there's updates for it like every couple of days. Yeah, correct or me if I'm every. Wrong. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Kevin Eastman's actually one that drew the cover for that, right? He was the original artist of the Ninja Turtles. Uh, yeah, I think so. Let me let me uh pull this up. Yeah, no problem. So for those of you listening, uh. Yeah, definitely go check that one out. I've been looking at the miniatures on that one myself. Um, I actually work pretty closely with IDW, so I I kind of known about it for a little bit. I just wasn't sure what scale they were bringing it out on, and it is actually pretty impressive. You know, I, I'm I, they don't really say um, what what scale it is, and it it plays kind of you know it's it's a mix of like a um, a board game and a tabletop game, as some of them have gone, like you're going to have tiles that you place as you move along in your adventures, and even some of those are uh, reversible. Um, Kevin Wilson, uh, with input from Kevin Eastman, uh, so it's designed by Kevin Wilson with input from Kevin Eastman. Okay, awesome. Um, now there is the works cover, which is. Um, well, 
the the level I backed at is going to be a pizza box cover, um, special variants of the turtles, and a signed lithograph from Kevin Eastman. Oh wow! So you went for one of the bigger ones? Yeah, I I, I went at the works package, um, just because I I wanted the game to come in a pizza box. And actually, one of the stretch goals gives me the other box cover too, as oh, really? as a lithograph. Yeah. So I'll get both of them. One of them I can, you know, totally hang up. So I'm kind of stoked about that. Nice, nice. Yeah, I haven't uh, – I saw when they launched. Uh, I got an email about it at work, but that was about as far as I got a chance to get into it. I know that you and my buddy Derek have been pretty excited about it. I know he backed it uh, fairly heavily as well. Um, I'm not exactly sure how much, but he was definitely impressed with everything they were doing and the fact they're bringing back the classic Turtles feel. I think that's yeah. a big draw for a lot of the fans. Yeah, no, I yeah, definitely. Um, I, I definitely am feeling it for for the classic look. Nice, nice. So, what else you got on the uh, on the roster of things you're excited about? R- really, right now, I'm sitting at I'm I'm really excited about a bunch of Kickstarters. It's terrible. My wife is gonna kill me when they actually start coming out. <laughs> you saw the one by uh, Massive Awesome, right? The Shattered Earth. I did. I so I first saw it. Um, Ash Barker's like, "Hey, check out these minis that I'm going to paint this week." And then I saw that um, Epic Duck Studio had a video, and he's like, "Hey, look at these minis." I'm like, "Okay, these minis look fantastic." I went looking for it. I'm like, "Those jerks! They got them before they even started off a Kickstarter." I want some, and then they, you know, announced the Kickstarter. So Shattered Earth, yes, that. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't even done a whole lot of reading about the game, but for one, it's a skirmish game. For two, it's a post-apocalyptic game. Usually those two combos together, I'm, <laughs> you got me interested. You know, That's my uh, okay. as well, yeah. <laughs> post-apocalyptic, you know, I blame Fallout. Uh, you know, been, been a huge fan since, like, Fallout 1. So, uh, you know, post-apocalyptic, I'm in. Oh, yeah, especially... Especially when they start catering to more of like the Fallout or like even some of the, the crazier stuff where you see characters running around in one shoe and a mohawk just because, you know, it kind of oh. gives it that bit of a pulpy feel, you know. Oh yeah, they definitely. Don't take it too seriously. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, after that, there's uh, Relic Blade. I got that also through uh, Guerrilla Miniature Games. Um, that this guy has designed the game himself. He's designed the miniatures himself. He's done every you know the rules, everything himself, and uh, you know he's put it out there. So that alone is cool. Um, the models look pretty awesome. Uh, you know I, I I like it. You know they they kind of generic in a way. And then looking at the game system, for one, you get your little. It's kind of a awesome mix of like X wing and tabletop. So you get your little stat card and you have what you can do with your character. And then you have so many points where you can buy more mods for your character. Give them extra spells or special items and stuff like that. So you can, you know, every game you play is going to be just a little bit different. And, gotcha. and, then, and then you play, you know, you, it's, it's um, good guys versus monsters, really. So, so, you know, someone's playing the monsters... And then someone's playing the good guys. And, you know, the monsters have the same thing. You can add things to them to make them just a little bit different than generic monsters. Um, it's kind of like a tabletop version of Diablo. You're, you're running out there and you're trying to collect loot. Great. So you're just hitting things till they explode in gold. Exactly. Awesome. Awesome. Which brings us to another game that I have actually been thoroughly enjoying is Frostgrave. I know you've been getting into that one as well. Yes, Frostgrave. I, I love Frostgrave, and and yes, I definitely I'm I'm trying to stoke the people around here. Like, there's a lot of people that are interested and in like Frostgrave. They just aren't playing. You know, it's it's just hard to you know. Even though it only is a you know like ten or twelve you know models, people don't put it in their car to bring with them somewhere. So it's like, hey, let's play Frostgrave, and they're like, oh, I forgot my stuff. Well. Don't forget it. Stop forgetting it. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell are you doing? Just throw the stuff in the car. Yeah. They released the Noel artwork, the cover artwork. I know we were talking about that earlier, but 
that that's just like the worst tease because it's not till like July that they're releasing into the breeding pits the the next expansion. Though they did just release the Cell Swords, which gives you a captain, which is amazing. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, with the captain, he is actually a normal soldier that can level up. Um Yes, no. He's he's a soldier, but he he can level up and he gets he gets what's called trick of the trades or yeah, tricks of the trade. So he can do different things as he levels up. So he's in addition to the wizard, he's the only other person that gets experience. The interesting part is not only does he get experience, but you have to pay him. Oh boy. So you have to keep him around. Right. So, so every, every time you go on an adventure and you get some, you get all your loot at the end, he gets a certain percentage of that. And as the rules are written, you can't fire him at the end of the, of the adventure until you pay him. Wow, so it's not like you could just... Well, there's a way around that, I guess. You could run him out there and intentionally get him killed. You could. I <laughs> I almost think they had a mechanic in there for that, but at the same time, you, you might not get his gear back or whatever, which is the other thing, actually. And I'm a little, yeah. But they, you know, they treat him like an independent character, which I do like. You know, he's his own entity. So unlike the other characters, which you can give stuff to and you can take away... If you give him something, he keeps it. Oh wow. You can't just you can't just give him that awesome sword and then just give him a crappy sword. You you you'd have to give him of something, you know, like equal value. Which is the other thing, unlike the other characters which have usually one slot, he has I think it's five like the wizard and the apprentice. So you can totally equip him any way you want. Give him sword and shield, two handed weapon, armor. Just load them up, see what happens. Exactly. Yeah, that's actually kind of a cool concept because one of the things I've noticed, and uh, we're we're still getting everything kind of formed up for our Frostgrave League at work. Um, you know, we dabble with the rules. We've done kind of like a couple of little demo games here and there. Uh, one thing that I've noticed with Frostgrave, you know, in the base set, is that when you're playing it, the only two really important models that you have are your apprentice and your wizard, your wizard being the most important past that. The rest of the guys are just kind of, I guess if you want to call them bullets and meat shields, and that's really about their job. Well, yeah, but that's, that's exactly how they just, they, they originally designed it. That, that's, that's like right in the forward of the book of the main rule book is these guys you know, they, they say don't spend your time naming them because they aren't going to stick around that long, <laughs> which at, it, it, at the same time, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, that's awesome. At the same time, I'm like, but I'm going to spend time painting this model. I don't want him to just die. I don't want him to die. He's going to get a name. Yeah. You can't just name him infantryman Ivan, send him out there and then think that everything's going to be OK when he gets his head chopped off by a barbarian. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Had that happen in the game. Yeah, we have <laughs> we have yet to use the random encounters. So let me back that up a little bit. For anybody who's new to Frostgrave, you can actually check it out. It's by Osprey Games. It is a skirmish fantasy game set in a frozen city, as they like to call it. Very similar to Mordheim in its feel. Uh, you are a warband led by a wizard and his apprentice going into the city of Frostgrave to grab treasures to build up your fortress. Um, during the time... You end up hiring these goons. Uh, they are kind of a general soldier. It's everything from warhounds, thieves, thugs, barbarians, crossbowmen. I'm forgetting some stuff in there. Nick, help me out. Oh, uh, marksmen, archers, thieves, thugs. You said those. Um, about the only one that, you know, there's variants just off of those. About the only thing extra is the um, alchemist you can get. Yes. And a tracker, I think, is the other one. Yeah, but he's he's really he's he's a bowman. It's just they give him a slightly different name. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, now, now, granted, uh, with um, uh, Thaw the Lich Lord, they did bring in some some other people like a javelinier and um, a raven master and a couple other uh, bard. Oh, and a pack mule. The pack mule is kind of cool. 
in, in the fact that if you need someone, you know, like you only have so many slots you can take stuff in. Well, a pack mule is designed purposely for you need, you know, a couple extra things. That's, you know, and it's a guy. He just, he's carrying your extra things in a bag. So he doesn't have any weapons. He can't really do anything other than carry stuff. But since part of the game is go in, grab treasure, get out, he can go in and grab, you know, you take whatever you need from him, and then you have him grab treasure and haul it out. Really? So the pack mule can actually grab treasure? Because I know that's one thing the warhounds can't do. Right, so the pack mule is a person. They just oh, call okay. him pack mule. See, I hear I'm yeah. picturing an actual mule on the table, just like walking around the middle of this damn city. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's actually a guy with a with a little bag slung over his shoulder. Okay. Not quite as entertaining because I was thinking I'm going to use my mule as a shield, put my archer I, I know. right in behind it, and just fire over his back. <laughs> it's not a bad idea. You could still do that with your pack mule. This is true, but it's not as funny. So, Frostgrave true. is one of those games to where they have some, like, official, unofficial models that are put out by North Star Games. But the beauty of Frostgrave is the fact that you can actually use whatever models you have. What models are you using for your uh, Warband right now? Uh, uh, right now, I have a mix of uh, Reaper and their official models. So they put out this uh, plastic kit for um, henchmen. And, uh, I think they call it the Frostgrave Soldiers. Uh, and the plastic kit's phenomenal. Um, I, I used it and I built up a bunch of them, but then I uh, switched over and I also got, and I call it my um, Vainglorious Bastards. Uh, it's, um, it's a box set of GW uh, Empire State Soldiers or something like that. So they've all got flat, uh, feathers in their caps, and <laughs> and I'd use some of the some of the uh, different things off of the soldier, the Frostgrave soldiers set to you know then make some of them archers and different things other than guys with either swords and shields or uh, two handed axes. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm uh, I've actually been using a lot of my uh, Nasir models from Wrath of Kings to make my Chronomancer speed. Death Cult working title. But uh, <laughs> I've uh, right now my warband actually consists of my wizard, my apprentice. I've got uh, two archers, two infantrymen, and a barbarian. So I am running a little bit light on models than what they recommend for a starting warband. But uh, I'm, I'm going to give it a try. I kind of built my Chronomancer instead of being a speed freak, is then more of a action point and just straight up action denial so we'll see how it goes so far so good but uh, you know on a you know quote unquote high level play if you want to call it that i don't know how well it'll do well so that's that's the fun part about it is yeah you have your um your core like you know i'm a chronomancer or i'm an enchanter or i'm a elementalist but you have access to almost every other school and uh, how they work it in Frostgrave is you have your core. Uh, there's what twenty-ish spells, something like that, yeah, right, right now. I think uh, what there's is there eight schools. Ten. Um, I think ten. So. Yeah. Yeah, and they have like four or five spells in each. But what it is is that you have your core school, then you have two uh like aligned schools so they're just a little bit harder to cast from and then you have have three non-aligned schools or is it three and three uh it's it's something like that and then you have one opposite school yeah. you know you have one opposite school that you can't use from and then you have i think it goes goes aligned neutral and then opposed. Yeah, that's correct. And so, and so you can you can draw spells from all except for your opposed school, and it just depending on what tier it it adds either a plus two or plus four to your casting roll, um, which is on a d twenty. So it's significant, you know, in enhancing the difficulty, but not insurmountable. And you can also, as you gain levels, you can spend one level 
just learning that spell a little bit better, even from somebody else's school. Right. So, so that's, that's the beauty of it is I might start out as an enchanter, but I can, you know, in the end be an elementalist or something like that more. I can, you know, if I just spend the time working on it. Yeah. That's one of the things I definitely liked is it didn't feel like, you know, in my case, I'm playing a chronomancer that 100% of my abilities are going to be about either speeding me up or slowing you down. I could, I could swap it out. I could, uh, like, I believe I took elemental hammer, which is great for the barbarian. Cause now I'm doing additional damage on the barbarian along with just slowing people down. So I could lock people in place, put elemental hammer on the barbarian, send the barbarian forward. Yeah. Hopefully it doesn't die. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Barbarians hit hard, but uh, they are not the greatest against arrows at all. So that's well, one thing I've definitely noticed. Yeah, so so barbarians are meant to hit hard, but they they don't wear any armor. So so that you know they they're just at a ten. They're you know as tough as a thief. They've got a few more hit points than than your basic thief thief or thug. So you know it's it's that trade off of I want to get in there and smash you, and then get out. So I've been I've been iffy. I you know I, I've been I've I've stared at a barbarian because a thief or thug costs you twenty gold. Granted, a thief they actually give a bonus to your opponent when they try and attack them. They're just that bad at attacking. Um, but you know a barbarian sits at like a hundred hundred and twenty gold. You know, it, so it's a significant in, investment in getting him and he's got a couple more hit points, but he's got the same armor. It's like, Oh, right. Made but then that. He hits like a dump truck. Right. And uh, granted you're either playing on a two by two or a three by three table. That's supposed to have, and, and they say it right there in setting up your table a lot. There should never be really more than one or two areas where you see more than 12 to 24 inches. You know, it, you, you, they really want you to build a city. They want you to be in a city type area where it's hard to see. And you end up not seeing a lot of boards like that because that's just a lot of terrain. It can be intimidating for a lot of people if they come from, say, like 40K or fantasy where they're used to having six moderate sized pieces spread out across an entire six foot by four foot table. Right. Yeah, definitely. Infinity players, they look at that and say, hey, what the hell? No big deal. We're used to that. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I just uh, I just finished uh, putting together. I started painting some of my infinity terrain and it is dense. And I was like, oh, hey, guys, you know, look at this. I, I finished my infinity terrain and I kind of marked off a four by four area on my table. And I'm like, you know, it, it seems to be pretty dense and all that. And someone's like, yeah, you need a whole lot more scatter and intervening terrain. Looks good, though. <laughs> I'm like, damn it. It took me like three days to put all this together. I, I haven't even started painting yet. <laughs> so did you end up getting MDF or did you get uh, resin terrain? Uh, it's MDF terrain. I got it from um, Shark Mounted Lasers. Um, and and it's it was it, at Christmas time. They had it like 50% off. It's their tournament kit. It's not even on their site right now. Actually, I'm not sure what's going on over there because they seem to be taking a lot of their stuff off the site. But, really? um, yeah, yeah, because I went back looking for their retro table terrain, and they've got, like, one building. Oof, that's brutal. Yeah, I, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I emailed him a little while back because I think I'm missing one L-shaped building. And uh, I haven't heard back, but I also haven't. I emailed him once. I, I kind of needed to follow up with that. But uh, but yeah, no, the terrain is awesome. I like it. It it went together really easy. Um, at first, it took a second to figure out how it how it was all going together because they have no instructions in there at all. Oh, that's the worst with MDF sometimes. <laughs> yeah, because it's like this is this is a weird puzzle this this like slots into here and that and you know at a couple of them you know like i played with it for a little bit at first and i'm like okay i think i know what i'm doing so i started gluing it and i'm like oh oh, oh shoot nope 
No, especially on some of the L-shaped buildings because you got to fit where it comes together at the L. You got to put one piece in first and then try and slide the other piece in. That's and then you've got to put in one of the other pieces. And so it's like, oh, shoot, I put this piece in first, and this piece won't fit right unless I – you know, so you're pulling it apart again. Oh, God, that brings back nightmares. I've had a couple of kits in the past. <laughs> when MDF first started coming out – now, keep in mind, for anyone listening out there, I'm kind of a terrain snob. Um, I say that with all love and respect to all M- MDF terrain guys out there, including my buddy Austin. Um, but he knows – I, I can't do MDF terrain that looks like boxes. Like, if you stand back from the table about 18 inches and it looks like a wooden box, I can't do it. It has to have some good looks to it. That being said, with some of the initial kits that I got of MDF terrain, they were a freaking nightmare. Um, I know they've come a long ways. Uh, a lot of companies out there are doing some good stuff. I haven't seen Shark Mountain Laser too much except online. I've never seen it in person. But I've seen, obviously, Austin stuff over at Death Ray Designs, Impudent Mortals, and Warsenals up close and personal. And their new stuff is way better than their originals. Yeah, well, I've only really been messing with MDF in the last three, four months. Uh, really, I bought... So I bought from... It was uh, the Death Ray Designs uh, Rust Point Kit through um, Brush for Hire. I bought that at Christmas time and got that. And I bought um, bought the Shark Mounted Laser at the same time, and, and both kits are awesome. I, now, the uh, the Brush for Hire, the Rust Point kit did come with instructions inside of it, and you kind of need it. Yeah, that kit in particular is quite amazing. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Would that be because you had something to do with it? I yeah, I, it might have, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so, folks listening out there. Go to DeathRayDesigns.com, buy the Rust Point set. There, there, I've done my plug, and uh, we'll go from there. But yes, it's an awesome set. I really like the fact that Austin did decide to throw in the directions with that, even though they are kind of shanty towns. Right. Um, about the only thing that took me a little while of just staring at it going, what? Was there, there's... Um, they, they say, you know, here's, here's like large hovel... A one. Here's large hovel A two. Here's large hovel A uh, V one. Here's large hovel V two. And I'm like, what does it mean? A one V one V. You know, a, how how did what it, what is this? You know, because at first I was looking at it and I'd started putting them together and I'm pretty sure I have a couple that are actually upside down from how they were supposed to go. Um. And you know, then it's realizing, oh, A meaning that the sides slope down and out, and V meaning they slope up and out, like a V or like an A. Uh, you know, I, I kind of had to slap myself in the forehead, and then I just claimed that it was uh, fatigue from moving, having the kids, getting them enrolled in school and daycare, starting the new job, you know. Uh, that that's what I was going with for for the der moment, <laughs> because I think some tucked somewhere on one of the instruction sheets in like fine print is hey this is what these mean, but right. it, but it's like tucked on there it's it's not you know like everything else is big got a picture you know, and that's just like at the bottom. Yeah, kind of the hey stupid section. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It totally applied to me, so it works. So tell us a little bit more about the shark-mounted lasers. I know you showed me some pictures of it online, but it looks like you actually got quite a bit out of that batch. Yeah, so it comes with it comes with a whole lot. Um, it comes with – let's see. doesn't come with the musket that I have in my hand, but – so it comes with a big uh, objective building. It's supposed to be the 8x8 building. It has um let me see let me flip around my camera here as i talk about it if i can figure that out there we go cool. so so right now it's sitting on my uh my handy little uh terrain holder that's actually not big enough but um there's there's this building which is my test paint um started 
not, not uh, I need to get some painter's tape so that I can, you know, like, you'll notice the blue kind of goes out of the lines. Yeah. I was never very good at that in school, so. Um, but uh, it's got, got eight of these um, buildings that are L-shaped. And the difference between some of them is, like, there's a door on this little part right here of the L. Um, and some of them have the door, have two doors. So there's one on the same spot, and then there's one on the back of the building. So there's one right here, and then that one right there. Okay, cool. And the, the doors are removable, so you can actually put miniatures in the buildings compared to just yep, saying the. That. Yeah, and so actually the roof's removed, so you can you can put them in there, which is important because you can put train and stuff, objectives and stuff like that, and have somebody standing at the door, the windows, you know. So if they're standing, you know, say right here, and somebody is here, you can't just shoot them because you can't actually see them. Gotcha. Uh, you know, same goes, which is really important for Infinity. Uh, and then in addition to that, there are... Here's more of the L shape. Then they do have, you might call them a shoebox. It's just a little building. Um, and and there's eight of these as well. Some of them have a single door. Some of them have a door on each side um, and the windows. And on the roofs, you'll notice some of these have, like this one has uh, it open on both sides. This one which I haven't glued enough apparently because it's coming apart, uh, isn't. It's it's actually closed on both sides. That's You get walkways that you okay. can put between the buildings. So you can make it so that you can have the vertical height and run across. Um, and then you get four of these buildings right here, which are squares, um, they have two doors and they can do the same thing with the different walkways and the little buildings fit on top of these bigger buildings. Okay. So, so you, you can, can stack it. Yep. So you can stack it so that you can put someone up here and you know, they can snipe from there. Awesome. So that actually seems like a pretty modular set, pretty easy to use. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I finished setting it up, brought it downstairs, put it on my table, and I had, uh, you know, just just threw it together really quick. You get uh, ladders as well that can fit in those same little slots on the roofs um, so people can climb up levels, um, and you can put the bridges. And, you know, I just, you know, in 10 minutes I set up, you know, all of the buildings in a 4 by 4 You just didn't have enough damn scatter terrain. <laughs> apparently <laughs> though the nice part is is as you're taking stuff apart like, like uh those windows and all that they actually still come with um with the little pieces of wood inside they're just kind of stuck there from when they were cut so they'll fall out and some of the other pieces are just little um little kind of oval ovals with a cutout in the center and so you can put the different pieces inside and so you can make little barricades and stuff like that. Oh, nice. So, yeah, uh, you know, I totally was I was putting stuff together. I'm like, ooh, look, trash pits. I can do something else with these. Yeah, that's a great thing sometimes with a lot of the MDF terrain is some the, the extra stuff that usually you throw out, you can end up turning into other stuff. Of course, that goes for any type of terrain making. So, God, this yeah. really sounded like an amateur. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, took, I took some of the, the doorways when I – punched them out and um i took those and put those on the same kind of bases so you do have um you know so now i have short barricade walls and i have taller walls that i can just kind of set up around corners and whatnot kind of like privacy fences and what and stuff like that nice nice so what else you got on your painting desk i know that uh we've been chatting the last couple of days about it over uh google hangouts and things like that What's some oh, of the goodness. other stuff you're working on? All right, so right now I've got I've got a pie I've got the Age of Sigmar starter box. Actually, the the local game store Gigabytes here that I go to put out a painting challenge for 
well, a, a Age of Sigmar challenge. It's it's more than just a painting challenge where you, you get tickets for a raffle for painting stuff, uh, playing games, putting up bat, bat reps, um, just anything Age of Sigmar, which, which has been awesome because, you know, there's been a few of us that have played it here and there, but it's really kind of poked people to get them get them into really playing it. Um, right. you know, which, which is awesome. I I've decided I'm not playing until I actually finish the starter box or at least one of the factions in the starter box, because I probably can't wait that long to actually play now that I've <laughs> really broken it open. Um, so I started on my Stormcast Eternals and, and I'm working on those. The, um, I am working on, I've got Nomads and Toha that I'm working on for Infinity. And then for uh, uh, Indie Skirmish Game, I've got, I've got um, from Hydra Miniatures, I've got two of their games. I've got Retro Ray Gun and I've got War Rocket. Uh, and if you guys don't know who they are, uh, these are, these are pulp. These are, you know, totally pulp sci-fi. This is this guy's called Optio. He's he's a robot for what's called the Steel Legion. He's he's pretty epic. Yeah, he's got that um, old Metropolis robot look to him. It's really cool. Exactly. Um and and they're they're pretty pretty sweet models. Um pretty good sculpts. The the guys uh um actually the the owner uh Matt uh, Buchamp, he um He's he's a art teacher in Michigan. Oh, nice uh, for for his regular job, and he does this. Um, here's here's like one of the big rockets for War Rocket, you know. So it's got that kind of nice pulp sci-fi, old school, and then one of your main enemies is is flying saucers. <laughs> I mean, that's awesome. How how can you not want to play a game that's got flying saucers? That's crazy. And, in, in both games, um, I got it, and I'm the only person in the area with it, so I'm trying to paint everything up nice. I'm not a painter. I'm, I'm not very good, but I'm trying to paint it up nice so that I can take it to the game store and start demoing it. Uh, actually, I was sitting there two weeks ago at Gigabytes, and they'd gotten an order, and I was kind of sniffing through the boxes of stuff they got, and I looked at the bottom, and I'm like, hey – I know that cover, and I reached down and pulled it out, and it was a retro ray gun uh, book. And I'm like, "Hey, you you actually got it?" And uh, David looked at me and went, "Well, yeah, you said you were going to play it. I had to at least look at it." So you know, that that definitely, if I didn't like Gigabytes to begin with, that definitely gave them more points. Oh yeah, David's always been really good about that. He, um, Gigabytes is actually a local store by us in Atlanta. Thing I really like about Gigabytes is the fact that the owner has done a fantastic job to keep himself established and relevant um, when a lot of gaming stores out there, quite honestly, do not. So he has gone out of his way to make sure that he is stocking a lot of the smaller games that uh, might only have a niche following, but he at least puts forth the effort to do that for the community so that way anybody that comes in with the smaller games can actually demo it and have other people buy into it yeah uh actually that's totally paying off for guild ball right now uh <laughs> blown up oh it's crazy um and and the game's fun i've only played a couple games of it and i've seen people play in games of it and pretty much any day you walk in there right now there's someone playing it uh and if it, you if people don't know what guild ball is it's it's Blood Bowl, but it's soccer. Yes, that's you know, probably that's, the best analogy I've heard. You know, um, and and you you have a you know the only thing about it is you you don't stop playing. There's like no resets of the game. There's no going back to the line of scrimmage. It's just you keep going. You have your kickoff, and then it goes until somebody scores points, and you get points for knocking people out. You get points for scoring goals. You get points for there's there's a couple of other ways you get points, and it, it's just really easy. 
you can play with uh, the starter kits. You get the starter kits. It comes with three models, and it comes with the – well, the starter kit doesn't come with the rules, but there's quick start rules right on the, the website for the – the manufacturer, the company, the publisher that puts it out, uh, Steamforged Games, I think. And and they're really simple. You know, it, it doesn't take a lot, especially with that starter set of rules. You can add more to it. It's a two-by-two two space for, for the starter set, for three models. Nice. Um, well, yeah, that's, that's totally awesome. You can play that pretty much anywhere. Uh, and then bigger games are played on a three-by-three three mat. And that's it, you know, and and that's when you're playing with your full, I think it's seven models. Okay, so it definitely scales up. I noticed that. And uh, they are already working on alternate teammates because I know that you're only allowed to have seven on the field. But uh, don't they have rules to where, like, for tournaments you can uh, – you kind of bring your whole faction, but you're only allowed to swap out, like, a certain amount of people per game session? Um, so right now it's, we're right now we're in season one, we're getting ready to move into season two and they're starting to put the season two stuff out and the season two stuff actually replaces some of your models. You don't ever end up with any extra models. You have your whole team. The only case where that's different is that they're the one faction in there. They're the mercenary faction. They're called the union and they have different characters inside of their, their team that you can use for your team. Okay. But, but there's only, you know, so certain ones will go with your team and certain ones won't. They actually, they have a special rule in there that says works well with, or will work with, and then who they will go with. Gotcha. Oh. Awesome. Yeah. Cause I haven't had a chance to really look at it yet. I have, uh, so between, obviously doing this podcast and the fact I'm on the throne of angels, uh, video blog, we have got far too many projects right now to even think about getting into another game. So, uh, Oh God, looking back at my desk here, uh, I've got age of Sigmar as well. Uh, I've got, uh, I am actually playing just uh, straight up corn war host. So that's either between the, uh, the bloodbound of corn and the corn demons with some chaos giants because it's always funny having big guys that when they fall over, they actually have a rule in the game called timber. When you kill off a giant, it will fall on other models and kill them. Uh, <laughs> so, which is hilarious to me. Uh, it is. We have got right now, currently four people uh, signed up for a Batman story campaign that we're going to be running. Uh, I myself am actually running Victor Zaz and the Arkham Lunatic ticks along with Hugo Strange and War Crazies and Killer Croc. So I've basically got the team of nut houses. Uh, Derek is going to be running Bane and his mercenaries, and then we've got somebody running Court of Owls, and one other person is going to be running essentially their version of the Justice League. Oh God! On top of that, I've got Asterians that I am getting currently painted up and washed in for Dead Zone, and uh, which will then bloom out into Warpath, the new uh, game coming out by Mantic. Kings of War Ogres. I got stuff I got to do with those. And then uh, we just got our hands on a bunch of stuff for Warzone Resurrection. On top of that, I am dabbling in Eden. And I think that is everything at the moment, which is quite a bit when you stack it all together and you have time frames on everything. So yeah, I've got no time for other games right now is what it really comes down to. So, um, yeah, you know, I'm definitely excited about it. It's just, it's a, it's a daunting task when I look at it as a whole. So past that. Yeah. I, uh, I got some terrain. I got to get painted. Uh, I got to finish up my frost grave war band. And a partridge and a pear tree. That's really all I got. <laughs> I know it sounds like such a small amount. It piles up. I, I, I had it all on one point on my table. Actually, I've even got um, stuff for uh, this is not a test, and and that's about a ten or you know fifteen man um, war band, and I've got three of them. Nice. Yeah, I've I've gone with some of the. Wild West Exodus guys. I'm going to have a bandits out of them. Uh, so I use a lot of the outlaws 
and then I have a peacekeeper, which is going to be, uh, it's a lot of the union guys, a lot of the union from wild west Exodus. And then I also from brother Vinny out of, uh, out of, uh, Russia, uh, very, very dubious in nature. Uh, they, they seem to, uh, resemble a very popular franchise of games very, very, very closely with power armor and robots and stuff like that. It's it's going to be my preserver faction, um, but they're they're called Nuclear Sandlot, and right. and they're just awesome sculpts. Now, granted, they stand almost a head shorter than the uh, Wild West Exodus guys, but in the greater scheme of things, I don't think that's going to affect them too much for uh for regular play you just got midgets and power armor exactly yeah and it's a good thing that they kind of alluded to what they are because nobody wants to see them have a falling out over uh what they're doing with their miniature line so uh (laughs) (laughs) i I definitely looked at them the other day when you sent me the uh the link and that was the first thing that popped in my head but they do look absolutely amazing they and and then you get the sculpts and and they're pretty beautiful. I, I, um, there, there's not a whole lot of whole lot of faults with them, even for being resin. I, I, I definitely am happy with them. That's I just awesome. need to, I need to get them primed and painted. I haven't even got them primed yet. I, I got them and I assembled them right away. Uh, I had, I had a whole lot of packing to do uh, during the move, and I was, I was already working here. And I went home one weekend, and that was my goal. And then those showed up that that Saturday, and I spent the rest of the afternoon putting all of these things together. Do 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> totally wasted my day. No, you didn't. Wasted like, miniatures together. That's not well. A I day yeah, exactly. I haven't had a chance. Well, I've had a chance to put others together since, but I I actually just primed my nomads today. Uh, those have been sitting waiting to get primed since probably before Christmas. Now that's Nomads for Infinity? Yeah, yeah, okay. Nomads for Infinity. Um, I Let's see, yeah, Prime, and then I have my um, Retro Ray Gun guys, except for I had to order a couple more to finish off some of the some of the units, so those are the only things not currently primed, but the rest of those are primed. They've actually been primed since almost the day I moved into the house. I like put some stuff away, you know, got some things organized, set up my game table, came downstairs and I'm like, ha, ah, I get to prime stuff finally. Nice. So I, I, I started putting those together. Now you were waving your hand back and forth. Like you're using a rattle can. I take it that you got pretty high off the fumes since you're doing it in a enclosed basement. Well, so I have a door outside right in my basement. So I kicked okay. that open <laughs> rattle can them near the door and then and then let them dry though the other day it was awesome when i was doing my uh my stormcast eternals because it was uh it was saturday and it was really really warm out so i just i kicked the door open brought them outside set them on my little um it's supposed to be a guest stool so people can sit it it really holds miniatures really well so it's a they, they, table it, it it is and so I brought it outside, and I, um, I, I rattle can them outside, and you know let them dry in the sun for a few minutes, and then brought some more out, and you know, it was a, it was real productive. Hell, I, I was, I was surprised. I, um, well, I think that was Sunday actually, because, because we were up till like two or three o'clock Sunday morning, and I was putting them together. Oh yeah, I remember we were up pretty late. That's when yeah. I actually managed to get together that. 10 man unit of corn blood letters by the way anybody out there that knows about the corn blood letters they are a giant pain in the ass <laughs> the fact that you gotta weave the face and the tongue through the back of their weird head dildo to get it to stick onto the body is uh wow yeah and the, the think i've got two more units of those i gotta put together for this shit well I'll and that's like the, the uh that's like the freaking uh dog that goes with the corn what champion or whatever uh out of the age of sigmar box because <laughs> you you put his face together and then you've got the tongue that you got to try and slide under while like basically the top of his rib cage has to slot in just right 
And of course, it's it's nice hard plastic. It doesn't really give to slide in properly. So you sit there and you get it just so far, and then it just stops. Uh, and it took me a while because I was scared I was going to break it. But I finally started like really applying pressure, and it it finally started like micro millimeters inching in. And I fi- I got it done, and I went screw this dog. I hope he dies in like every battle. <laughs> Now you didn't put the dog on the base with uh, the why am I forgetting the name of the damn thing, uh, the mighty Lord of Corn, did you? Or did you leave You're the dog separate? No, the dog's supposed to go on the base. Okay. He, he's he's chained to his hand, so yeah. he's got him on a leash. So he's supposed to be standing on the base with him. Right. I see. When you showed it to me the other night, I thought for some reason you had him separate. I was like, oh, that's a cool way of doing it. I would have, but then the the mighty Lord of Corn wouldn't have had an, had an arm. Oh yeah, that's because... true. Because I forgot how that went together. It's been a while since I've actually had to look at how the assembly went on that. Yeah. Piece of shit. It was such a pain. I remember. <laughs> so annoying. Awesome. So what else you got uh, planned for this weekend? Any games you got, you're going to be playing? Uh, actually, this weekend I'm going back to Florida to do some packing and whatnot, um, and and take my wife out to a to a very special dinner and you know Deadpool and treat her really nicely. Yeah, we because all know what that means. It's it's Valentine's Day weekend, and you know I've got a you know priorities. You know, I told her we have a great romance movie to go watch. I told her it was a romantic comedy. I may, may have used Facebook memes to convince her. And then she said, you just want to go see Deadpool, don't you? And I went, yes. <laughs> She's like, all right. I've already bought tickets. Nice, nice. Yeah, I've uh, got a little weekend planned for the wife. I'm not going to say too much because I know she's in the other room. You know, right now all she thinks we got is some dinner. That's it. So uh, I'm not going to uh, talk about it too much. Maybe this next episode I'll go into some detail. <laughs> Not all of the details, you bunch of perverts, but uh, just enough for what you need to know. So, past that, man. Uh, yeah, I really don't have too much else on the desk at the moment. I think I've pretty much covered everything that is uh, filling it up. Yeah, the only thing I managed to get primed this weekend, you actually got a lot more primed than I did. The only thing I got was just uh, a stone giant primed up. And that's it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, I spent most of the weekend on assembly. I mean, you saw the uh, yeah the small trove of dudes that I've got and uh, the other giant. So if anyone's looking for an impressive model that you want to put on the table, I'm not going to lie, it's expensive. Um, Mirs Miniatures makes what's called the Yotun. It stands probably five inches tall, six inches tall, if I were to guess. And uh, if you look at it in a direct comparison to most other models out there, it will dwarf anything. If you guys are uh, familiar with uh, War Machine, I actually put some of the older War Jacks, not the newer ones, some of the older ones that stood about uh, two and a half to three inches tall. They maybe come up to his waist. It's a big model. So I'm pretty impressed with it. I kind of want to get this guy painted up and uh, put him on the table as well. So... That's going to be exciting. But, uh, yeah, past that, this weekend is going to be filled up with Valentine's Day and uh, hopefully getting a little bit more primed, a little bit bit of stuff done, sneaking it in here on Sunday. But we'll see. Yeah, definitely. Um, oh, the other thing I have, uh, I'm probably not going to break it open for a little bit longer, is uh, Drop Zone Commander. Nice. I, I yet picked to play that one. Yeah, I haven't played it yet. I picked up the two player starter set. Um and I just I haven't I, I opened it up, I, I looked at all the inventory. It was it was very honestly I walked in and I went, Huh. Kind of been eyeballing it. All right, I'll I'll buy the two player starter set. Of course when you buy a two player starter set, you're supposed to finish the starter set and you know invite someone to play with you. But I just yeah. I, I put it together for real quick and then took it apart. Well, I, I put together some of the buildings. Uh, the buildings are kind of neat. Actually, I like the buildings that – how the buildings are designed in the uh, Operation Ice Storm for Infinity. Just a little bit better. 
Uh, they just they fold in really nice, and they look really, really, really nice. The uh, you know same same idea kind of buildings, except for a smaller scale. Um, for for drop uh, drop zone, and and they just the roofs don't fold as nice as I would like. Ah. They don't they don't just sit in there. Um, it looks like I'm going to actually have to take and put them in there and then like glue them to hold them together, which isn't going to be a bad thing because I don't plan on really hauling them around. I've got my game table here. So, you know, once I start playing, I won't have to go anywhere with them. Right. Yeah, that's definitely true. I didn't really think about that one because, uh, I remember looking at some of them, but, uh, do they now with those? Do they collapse down to make them portable to take elsewhere, or not really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, they totally fold up. They. You know, um, uh, I was actually uh, I was doing an Airbnb when I first got here, and I bought it, and I put them together, and I just kind of sat them in this corner of the room in the Airbnb for a couple weeks, and I, you know, it was supposed to be my reminder to put everything else together, but I I think I threw a shirt over them, and you know. Left them there till like the day I was I was moving out of the room, and I was like, "Oh hey, yeah." And I, I took them and folded them up, and it all fit right back in the box just fine. I, you know, can take you know just grab the box and go once I put everything else together. Nice, nice. Well, we should probably get wrapping this one up so we don't start rambling on like a couple of assholes. So, is there anything else you want to throw in at the end? Um. Oh, so two things. One of them, I just got a package from England. It it, um, it was the uh, old GW uh, battle cars. Uh, so I forget what its name was. It, GW put it out. It was kind of Mad Max, uh, you know, road card game. And somebody put it up on a uh, Facebook uh, old hammer trading group or whatever. And and I I picked them up because you know once again you know, now, now you've added Mad Max into post-apocalyptic. I got to pick those up. But that also follows in line with um, I've got a bunch of little cars from from these people. It's Roadkill game. Uh, they had a Kickstarter a while back, and they did they did the cast for the game, and they're awesome. I finally got them. I got a big package of them. Another game that came with a whole bunch of, you know, like I've got a, they're six millimeter, it's, no, I think 10 millimeter scale vehicles. And it's got a um, tractor trailer in it that's just, it's honking. Like you pick up the tractor trailer and I almost say you could kill someone with it because they're, they're all pu- pewter done. Oh man. And it's solid. Yeah. It's just solid. <laughs> uh I almost dropped it on my toe, and I'm like, oh, oh, no, no, don't do that. I'll be going to, like, the hospital. Oh, brutal. How did this happen? I dropped a toy tractor trailer on my toe. Yeah, I can see how that goes. Way to be an adult. <laughs> yes. No, it's not for my kids. It's for me. <laughs> it was mine. Yeah. <laughs> I don't let my kids touch these. Are you kidding? <laughs> Oh God, I've I've got a young niece and nephew. I wouldn't even want to imagine what would happen if they got their hands on some of the miniatures I have. Ugh. <laughs> now I'm gonna so, have nightmares. So actually, my kids are pretty good. They they know you know basically hands off on a lot of the stuff, but I um I I usually have some of the extra sprues of of different things like uh about the War Games Factory Viking sprue or you know Viking box. For Frostgrave, and I've I've only put a couple together. They're kind of just a little small, so with my other two sets, I haven't really needed them. I figure I'll use them for something, but every now and again, I'll glue one together for my uh, my youngest, and you know, then he's got a couple of action figures like Daddy, and runs off and plays with them. Comes to me, you know, an hour or two later, he broke the arm off, <laughs> so glue it back together and send him off again. Nice, nice. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think this is probably a good sp- section to wrap it up here. Um, I know this next week we'll be uh, actually starting to have the podcast with guests. Normally, this podcast <laughs> will start having uh, a lot of uh, guests from the industry, either people from a YouTube channel, 
uh, people that have upcoming Kickstarters, products they want to uh, let the world know about a little bit more. Uh, just personal friends of ours so we could sit back and banter and bullshit a little bit here and there. And, uh, yeah, just getting to know some of these people more on a realistic level outside of just, hey, we all play games. Anything else you want to throw in there before we go, Nick? No, I think I'm good. <laughs> all right. I, I don't want to get spun up anymore. <laughs> cool, man. All right, well, this will be the end of Episode 1 of Skirmish Supremacy. We will see you all next time.